wonderful colleague from Yale who is in the Department of Anthropology, but is a remarkable person in terms of her expertise and the work that she's been doing around the globe. And she's going to share some of that with you today. Some of her real areas of expertise have to do with resilience and stress and how we cope with all of that and biomarkers. But my favorite paper, although she just is finishing one about grandparents and I'm a very fortunate grandparent. Um, but uh, the favorite paper that I have of hers, of course, is the one about fatherhood and the fact that this is an area that has not been fully explored and hasn't been fully utilized and in terms of empowering the fathers as well as the mothers to make a difference in the lives of their children. So with Catherine, um, the floor is yours. <coughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. <laughs> what I'd like to do today is to give you an example, a case study of how to leverage the power of science to demonstrate the effectiveness of intervention in conflict settings. Um, because in conflict settings, you really want to know whether you mean well and are doing okay, or whether you are really bringing benefits to children and their families. In conflict settings, um, it, it, working in conflict settings is really challenging. Um, we know that 250 million children are affected by conflict globally, by armed conflict globally. Um, we know from a Save the Children report that we can see the scars of six years of war in the wake of the Syrian crisis on the body and the minds of children with respect to toxic stress impacting child development. And I'm going to take you to Syrian refugees that are resettled in Jordan. Um, Jordan is hosting at the moment about 660,000 refugees and 2 million Palestinians. Um, and you can see, you can, you know, there are therefore many interventions going on in Jordan to alleviate suffering for children. The big question to ask is what kind of intervention we need to put in place in conflict settings. And the humanitarian mandate in conflict settings is twofold. The first is to alleviate suffering, save lives, rebuild lives, and therefore think about the sectors of health, protection, and education, and livelihoods. And the second is also to lay the foundation for peaceful recovery, to instill hope, um, build resilience, and sustain social cohesion. So I had the privilege to be brought in as a scholar to help test the effectiveness of intervention led by Mercy Corps with Syrian refugees in Jordan. The intervention was called Advancing Adolescence, or Nobadir in Arabic. It was an eight-week brief intervention focused on older adolescents, eight to 15 years old, youth affected by the Syria and Iraq crises, potentially reaching 400,000 uh, kids who were um, in Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, Syria, and Turkey as part of the wider initiative of the no, called the No Lost Generation. And that intervention was based on a principle of profound stress attunement, which think something like mindfulness, if you want a, um, a near equivalent. It is strategic in focusing not just on early childhood, but on adolescent, which is a time um, to protect the next generation and build its future. And it was innovative by bringing together both Syrian refugees and Jordanian non-refugees to establish some kind of reconnection and social cohesion. So their um, theory of change is something like this. We know they see that the 10 to 19 year old is also a critical decade, decade of development with a series of life changing transition. The moment is now for the right support at the right time to bifurcate the trajectories of adolescents either towards gaining new skills and getting involved with community or having poor skills and possibly engaging in violence. The theory is this, we can intervene on three levels. 
We can protect children by giving them safe spaces. We can give them better and trustful relationships with their peers and their mentors. And we can give them skills, vocational soft skills, all through this um, umbrella of profound stress attunement. The stated outcomes will be that I will reduce your profound stress, I will build your resilience, and I will build social cohesion in your community. And the long-term outcomes that we are hoping for would be reduced risky behaviors for adolescents growing up in the region, um, better economic and education attainment, and social stability. This is an example of a drawing, six foot drawing, drawn on the wall of a community center by a young man going through the profound stress attunement approach. And it mirrors for me what it means for a young man to, uh, what stress attunement means, meaning that you connect your heart with your brain to be able to move forward as an advancing adolescence, to advance forward, to move forward as a whole person, to have the wings to fly and not stumble under the weight of adversity. Our goals as scholars for the research consortium was to establish robust evidence of impacts and develop a toolkit that would enable you to test the intervention. So we conducted a cohort study. It was funded by R2HC, Research for Health in Humanitarian Settings. It was conducted in collaboration with Dr. Rana Dajani from We Love Reading. It was a randomized control trial. It had about 800 kids. It had equal numbers of males and females and refugees and non-refugees. And it was three ways of data collection, before the intervention, after the intervention, 10 weeks on, and one year follow-up. And our toolkit tried to answer this question. Does this intervention, short intervention, improve the psychosocial, the biological, and the cognitive outcomes of kids? In other words, I wanted to measure the impacts on the mind on the body and on the brain. So we conducted usual survey with self-reports asking how people feel, how resilient they feel, how stressed they feel, biomarkers of hair for hair cortisol, and cognitive tests on tablets. And I'll just ask then, the rest of my presentation is just ask three, four basic questions on whether we can see whether we are bringing benefits to the lives of children. So the first question is, does stress attunement intervention, think mindfulness, actually help people feel better as they report? And the answer is uh, yes, it does, especially with this insecurity tool that we use, which is really the fear. Before the intervention, at least half the sample felt insecure in their environment always or nearly always at the time. And after the intervention, they felt much better than waitlisted controls. And that effect lasted for more than one year. In terms of resilience, however, there was no change at all. And we're actually quite proud of our tool on resilience because we developed the first Arabic language brief, valid, culturally grounded tool for resilience um, for refugees and non-refugees in the area. And I want to point out to you that resilience operates at three different levels. Individual strengths, trusted relationship with my family and my peers, and my resources in the community. This intervention only acted on individual strengths. So it was not enough to move the needle in terms of an eight-week intervention. And so we know that to boost resilience, you have to work with families and communities, not just individuals. But that's the way to measure it. Second question, in terms of your body. Does stress attunement help you regulate the stress you feel in your body? So we measured stress under the skin, the physiological signature of that intervention before and after. We do that through measurements of hair cortisol. As you may know, um, cortisol is a hormone that is produced under psychosocial stress. It accumulates in your body and in your hair by taking small segments of hair near the scalp. Um, I can find out what the level of stress is in an individual. We know we can do that pre and post exams, pre and post surgery, pre and post divorce, so you might as well do it pre and post intervention. So we did and um, it was very well received in the sense that we employed hairdressers to be part of our field team and give kids a professional haircut. The outcome of that is rather spectacular 
because the intervention, eight weeks, decreased cortisol levels in the hair of young kids by a third, which is really quite an astounding, unexpected result biologically. And proof of concept. If, if you change the social environment just a little bit with secure, safe place, secure relationship with mentors and some skills, you're able to see a biological impact. Interestingly, in terms of a population, we could be part of three different groups. The people on the left have high cortisol level. They're dialed up. They're on high alert. They're ready to move and to act. And for them, the intervention did reduce what you might see as called toxic stress. There's a middle bit of people who are just absolutely moderate. And there's another group that shows very low cortisol, really, really low. And for those people, the intervention actually raised cortisol, helped them correct that blunted response of withdrawal that their body makes, perhaps because of overload. So we found a substantial benefit of the intervention, not just in reducing high stress, but moving up very low cortisol when people disengaged, which is also a remarkable result. Third. Did a stress intervention actually do anything for the cognitive skills? And the answer is no, it did not. What works to improve well-being and uh, regulate biological stress does not necessarily improve cognitive skills. And we measured those, for example, by giving kids an iPad where they have to touch the opposite side of the screen where the little um, icon comes up. So you'd have to like, be able to control your reflex of touching somewhere on the screen. It's possible that the intervention doesn't do very much. Actually, being on high alert is, is a good thing, um, but it did not lead to any cognitive improvement as we can measure it. And fourth, did it have any impact on social cohesion? Mercy Corps measured three measures of social cohesion. The trust in your in-group, meaning Syrian refugees to Syrian refugees, or Jordanians to Jordanians. The trust in your out-group, meaning how much do you trust somebody who's from the other group, non-refugee, let's say, and your relationship with the out-group, Syrians to Jordanians, Jordanians to Syrians. And they found that there was a measurable improvement, which we don't know can be either due to contact and putting Syrians and non-Syrians or refugees and non-refugees in the same environment and having friendship, or actually due to a reduced sense of stress that enables you to build more trust trusting relationship. But it is an indication that alleviating stress does work for social cohesion, as measured by these measures there. So I have two more slides, and I want to just talk about take-home messages. The first take-home messages would be for programming and policy. What matters to me as a scholar is to convey what matters in terms of the evidence. And the evidence shows that adolescents as you can imagine, children and adolescents affected by the Syrian crises will benefit from this targeted psychosocial support programming, which is geared to reducing feelings of overwhelming stress, where your brain and your heart is disconnected and you're unable to move forward. But improving resilience will take more than just individual level approaches of tickering with the individual child. It does involve families and societies as a whole. We need to learn much more about the links between the risk and resilience and the long-term outcomes in terms of economic opportunities, educational attainment, and probably engagement with peace and violence. For human agency, what matters is what they can build into the compact for refugees, as we just heard, um, to build commitment to provide support, psychosocial and social and economic support to young refugees and deliver intensive interventions that work. For, for science, um, the takeaways for me is that it is possible to really rigorously evaluate program effectiveness, even in conflict settings, beyond self-reports. That the signatures of stress are changeable and malleable. So within an eight-week intervention, think yoga, think mindfulness, think profound stress attunement, you can design an intervention, well-designed intervention will bring benefits. But that regulate, which you can't overstate your point, 
and you have to manage expectations because just regulating stress won't necessarily do everything else that you want to do, such as boosting resilience and social cohesion. Those outcomes need very substantial investments. For my, to my mind, science has power. The power of science, as I found, is that it helps you make very um, interesting partnerships with people when you talk about science partnerships with the families themselves that want people to know about the intergenerational consequences of stress and trauma and the violence of war and what can be done about it. Partners with scholars, practitioners and, and uh, policy makers. Partners who fund these kinds of uh, research evaluation and of course partners with the media. So I'll close by showing this one last slide of the work uh, that we did was taken up by science in the issue facing up to adversity. It was called, titled, In War Zones, Re Re Researchers Are Putting Resilience Interventions to the Test. And I believe quite strongly that the two reasons why we got that kind of media coverage is simply because we used the power of science, as in biomarkers, to test something objectively. And we had a whole society approach to inclusive partnerships with funders, with media, and with local scholars and local families. Thank you.